I'm often asked uh, questions like this, whether it's possible to have a healthy relationship after um, uh, adverse childhood environments and CPTSD. It's got to the point where on Instagram, whenever I run a, a, a Q&A, people start, like 80% of the questions become dating questions. Now, I'm gonna say to you what I say to people on Instagram, you're asking a 44 year old man with a string of failed romantic relationships behind him for dating and relationship advice. How big of a pinch of salt should you take my advice with? That's the first question you wanna be asking yourself. Anyway, here's the question I've been asked, which I'll attempt to answer. Do you think it's possible to have a healthy romantic relationship after a lifetime of narcissistic abuse, childhood sexual abuse, and CPTSD? Six years of intense inner healing work here. I'll never stop working on me. Seems hard to find someone who's grounded. Or maybe it's still just me. And th this was one of the most upvoted questions, so it's uh, an indication that this is, this is of concern to a lot of people. I can give you a, a, a very simple and short answer, which is yes. The end, thank you for your time and your, no, I'm joking. Um, yes, I, I do think it's possible to have a healthy romantic relationship, even after childhood sexual abuse, narcissistic abuse, and CPTSD. Um, is it possible to have a healthy romantic relationship all on our own terms? No. Um, would it be possible to have a romantic relationship all on our own terms, even without CPTSD, narcissistic abuse, and so on and so forth? No. The simplest answer I offer is yes, theoretically, I think that, of course, like, we shouldn't talk or, or think about healthy romantic relationships like it's some sort of unsolvable puzzle. Around this subject, well, up until 2012, I taught people how to, to headbutt and knee each other in the face. I was a self-defense instructor. Before that, I worked in the education system trying to get kids to not stab each other and sit down long enough to pass their GCSEs. And before that, I was teaching homeless drug addicts um, to not take drugs and to not commit crimes to feed their, their drug habits. And during and in between all of that, I was working nightclub security. So I'd be basically trying to stop drunk people, high people from beating each other up in clubs. In all of those environments, and in all of my experience with my friends and family, I've noticed this tendency to sort of play hide and seek with ourselves as far as romantic relationships are concerned. And they can get complicated, and there are complicated, undoubtedly they bring complexity with them. But I don't think they're as complicated as, as we pretend. I think we're playing a bit of a game. I'm gonna misquote Kierkegaard here, he said we deliberately make our concept of Christianity complicated in a way that we know it isn't, because if we took it for the simple doctrine that it is, it would demand too much of us and we would have to change our ways. The implication being that we change Christianity, we deliberately mystify it and lend levels of complexity to it just so that we don't have to follow it. So that whenever we don't follow the simple doctrine, we can go, oh, well, it's, it's, it's open to interpretation. It's incredibly complex. I think we play the same game with relationships. My favorite thing now is if I'm in a seminar and people ask me about relationships is to say, oh, you want to talk about relationships and making relationships work. So you want to ask me, ladies and gentlemen of the audience, and I look into their eyes like this. You want to ask me how to successfully live inside of the same house as another adult for decades of your life? And I ask that. And they look shocked, or they start laughing nervously. And some of them will make weird noises. They go, ah, rah, 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 when I say that to them. And I'm like, what, what's the big deal? What's the big deal? Why is there a gap between our notion of, oh, a successful, just a successful, just beautiful, romantic relationship, and living in a house, with the same adult for decades. What, where, where's, where's the gap? Where's the gap? Why is there a gap? Why is there a gap? In that gap of bullshit, all of our problems lie. All of our problems lie. Because here's the reality and there's fantasy. Those two things need to be mapped onto each other or you will suffer. And you do, everybody does, everybody suffers. 
reality versus fantasy. I want, I want my successful, loving, romantic relationship. That's you living in a house with the same adult for decades. That's your definition, not mine. It's the same thing like when people come to me and they say, I want to make more money. And I go, OK, take a sponge and a bucket, knock on your neighbor's houses and offer to wash their cars for five quid. You said more money. You said, well, now you have, you wash five cars, you now have 25 quid. That's more money. Oh, that's not what I meant. Well, what did you mean? What did you mean? Get specific, get realistic. Can you have a, a successful romantic relationship where you both live in different countries or where you're swapping partners or you're like, what do you mean? I feel, I don't feel, I know perfectly well what people are doing. It's a kind of mental masturbation. They're sort of, they're, they're, they're masturbating around the issue. They're lending a drama and a meaning where there is none. There just isn't any. Successful, healthy, romantic relationship is uh, routine. It's, it's daily routine. It's the payment of bills. It's, you know, you know how your partner likes coffee in the morning, or maybe they don't like coffee, they, make, they like tea. Uh, you know what music they like. Uh, you know what they like to do at the weekends. And, and it's, it's, it's a series of small, repetitive, uh, details that accumulate over time. That's a part of being in a successful, healthy, romantic relationship. Now, if that frightens you, or makes you feel smothered, or makes you feel uncomfortable, or the notion of, um, there's another thing I like to bring up, you compromise. You, there are things in your life that you simply sacrifice for the relationship, and you expect your partner to sacrifice for the relationship multiple things that you sacrifice and then you bring all that together and I say that to people and they start to twitch and their forehead sweat and the lip curls a little bit they're like that's not what I meant and I'm like what did you mean did you mean an experience that you could consume in which you got everything that you wanted because it's actually all about you with no compromise whatsoever and you don't bring anything to the relationship you don't offer anything to the relationship you're not in service of the other person as much as they're in service to you and then you'll get idealists going, it'll be in the comments, nobody's in service to anybody because all romantic relationships are perfectly equal. Okay, that's, that's great. Are you single? Oh, you are. Yeah, okay, but I guess I'm wrong then. And I guess uh, your philosophy is working just fine for you. You've got to get past the bullshit, ladies and gents. You've got to get past it. Like, what, what do you mean? Do you mean I want my mother's breast back in my mouth? Do you mean I want to return to the feeling when I was three years old and, and my daddy hugged me? Oh, well, get, that's gone. That's gone. The all-inclusive, all-subsuming, uh, um, oceanic experience of, of unconditional love that a, that a parent gives a child, if that's what you're looking for, well, you're, you're not a child. You still have a relationship. If your father's alive and you still have a relationship with him, you can't experience that same level of oceanic love because you're not a child anymore. And, and that's not a parent anymore. You're an adult too, so you're the same as your father. You're the same as your mother. You can't go back. You can't go back. The closest thing that you can get to that, if you care about it, I don't. I'm a bit weird. I'm a bit of an outlier. It might be genetic. I don't know. The closest thing you can get to that is having your own children. That's it. That's all, that's all there is. It's limited, it's extremely limited. Or, well, it's limited if you find that limiting. Perhaps for some people, I think that that's almost a, an experience that's so wonderful, it's, it's religious. I can see that on some people. They have children. They have their own children and their children are like, bleh, they're the center of their world, the center of their universe. And they, you know, I've had people tell me they feel high from the fact that they've had children when they interact with their children. I go, that's great, that's fantastic, wonderful. What a great thing, you gave life. You have this godlike ability to give life. How fantastic, that's wonderful. What do you mean? What do you mean? I don't like talking about things without, with implication, with uh, suggestion and like implicit biases and bits of weird ideology and stuff that we've picked up from from movies, I'm like, I don't, I don't like this, it's silly. Because then, 
Then we have silly billy conversations and we're all doing tinky winky talks. Hey, dee -bee -dee 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 -dee. Oh, I love you. I love you too. Hee <laughs> hee, fingity bingity. I'm like, oh, stop. You're adults. You're not kids anymore. It's over. If you, if you uh, try to do it like a child with another child and it doesn't work, I'm just going to say, well, what did you expect? If you try to manipulate somebody into doing something that they don't want to do or push somebody into a relationship they don't want to be in and it doesn't work, what did you expect? Love, a healthy relationship, can only take place between two sovereign adults with some degree of agency. They don't have to be perfect. They don't have to be Marvel superheroes, but they have to be adults. And they have to have done some degree of therapeutic work where they've integrated their own shadow. They have to have humility. They have to have the ability to argue. That's a strength. That's a skill. They have to have the ability to self-respect, to self-reflect. That's a strength. That's a skill. All of that has to be sorted out first. The idea that like having a healthy romantic relationship because we had shit upbringings and we bring our own problems to the table, I don't even really see that as that big of a problem. Like, go to therapy, do the work, try and become emotionally re-regulated, stay in therapy for, for the duration of the relationship if you need to. I don't see it as being that big a, um, I don't see that as being the big barrier. Oh, I had childhood trauma. Okay, well, everybody is traumatized to some degree. Yours, mine might be worse than the people's. We might have more intimacy issues. You might have more sexual hangups, more this, more that. But ultimately, everybody is bringing their stuff to the relationship. So I'm not worried about whether you had childhood trauma or not, per se. I'm very, very, very worried, very concerned about the nonsensical ideological loading around relationships in this culture. I mean, I'm just like, the fact that you had terrible childhood trauma, I'm not particularly concerned. The fact that you're American, I'm massively concerned. Or that you're British or Canadian, massively concerned. Because it's a mess right now. It's a, like the, the attitude people bring to relationships is so appalling, in my humble opinion. I'm amazed any of them work longer than two years, quite frankly. Really, any of them. I'm like, wow, well done. And when I see them work, the, the, there's a few relationships I've seen work that I'm like, wow, that's good. They're either very, very religious people. And by the way, the research backs me up on this one. They're either very religious people with an extremely low body count. I don't care whether you find that distasteful or not couldn't give a shit, the research backs this. Very, very religious people, very low body count, not that much previous sexual experience, they have a much, much better chance of making healthy long-term relationships last. Two adults living in the same space for decades, at peace, they make that last. Um, the other thing I've seen work is very psychologically literate people, but they're not just doing, you know, a chatty chatty in terms of psychology terms, they're going to therapy. They're not just doing the work. Oh, we're doing the work. They're really there and they're sincere, they're earnest, and they're genuinely vulnerable with each other as two adults. They're not using psychology to dominate each other. They're just presenting as two adults. And in those cases of healthy relationships, of all the people I know all around the world, I can think of three, three, just three, that I would consider to be healthy and that will probably last for decades in peace and in some degree of fulfillment. Most people too ideologically infected, too selfish, too immature, nowhere near shadow integrated enough uh, for the relationship to last peacefully. Some relationships last for a long time, but the, either one or both of the partners is being tortured. And you can see it, their eyes go dead, or they get really fat, or they get really thin, or they become really depressed, or they become alcoholic, and you're like, wow, what's the trauma you're going through? And they're going, I don't know. They're being tortured by the relationship. It's just not a comfortable fit for them because to finish off, not to be put too pontificatory or too mystic with this, uh, and I have to use slightly obf obfuscatory language because it's Jungian language. If the shadows are not integrated in both partners, say if, if, if I get with somebody and I am shadow integrated to a degree and my partner isn't, who carries her shadow? Who carries her shadow? Me. If, if the relationship is going to work. Because if I don't carry her shadow, 
will split up. Can she carry my shadow? No, she's not shadow integrated. She can't even carry her own shadow. Do you see what I'm saying? It's not a boy-girl thing. Say uh, I'm gay and it's my boyfriend uh, uh, and he's shadow integrated and I'm not. And so he's the emotionally mature one who's somewhat shadow integrated, who's, who's self-reflective. He's actually been to therapy and he's been earnestly. And I haven't, I'm a, a party boy. Who's gonna carry my unintegrated shadow? Me? No. If, if I was single and I didn't have him, I'm not carrying my shadow. I just let it bump into people. I just trash people. I just trash my life. I trash other people's lives because I have an unintegrated shadow. We're in a relationship together. If he, if he refuses to carry my shadow, how would we have a relationship? We wouldn't. We wouldn't. If, 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 he, if he says, wow, you've got a really unintegrated shadow there, bro. I ain't carrying that shit, which is what he should do. Then we, we would meet and I don't know, you'd have a fling that lasts a week and after three meetups with me, he'd be like, wow, this guy's kind of, he wouldn't think, oh, he's got an unintegrated shadow because only Jungians think that way. But he would think, God, this guy's a bit of a dick. Or, or if he's kind, he'd think, he'd think, uh, oh, this guy is, uh, he's too emotionally immature for me. He's, he's hot, but, or whatever, whatever the initial attraction was, like between two people, you think they're interesting, you think they're funny, you think they're hot, you think that they've read the same books as you, or they, you both like horse riding or whatever it is. Yes, they tick these boxes for me, but they're too silly for me. A truly shadow integrated person can do that, and they'll go, they'll go, they're too silly what they might mean is the shadow of that person is not integrated enough for me to cope with. I won't carry it. Otherwise, in the uh, example I gave before, he would have to carry my shadow. In the example I gave before that, if I meet a woman and, and she's not shadow integrated and the relationship goes forward for months, I must carry her shadow and mine. So if you want to, uh, uh, maybe this is interesting for people who are the, who've been in narcissistically abusive relationships. When you're in a narcissistically abusive relationship, part of the exhaustion and the confusion you feel is you end up carrying the narcissist's unintegrated shadow. You have to, you have to for the relationship to move forward. Otherwise, you just wouldn't be together. You just, it would just crumble. You end up, if, if, or if you like, not shadow integration, let's use order and chaos and then I'll wrap this up. If I'm ordered and you're chaotic, a relationship is order. If I'm ordered and you're chaotic and I don't bring order to you, I just allow chaos, that's not a relationship because relationships are order. So you're, so okay, here's the example. I meet a girl, complete chaos. She is the uh, archetypal, artistic, uh, open, creative type. She's totally chaotic. She takes drugs, she's in, she does, I don't know, gigs of modern interpretative dance and then at other times she does mumble rap with her band or whatever. And she's always out doing gigs and always out drinking and taking drugs and being promiscuous. I guess I could permit that to happen. I guess I could be like, I will not bring my order to her life. I will not restrain her. I will love her as I go to bed at eight o'clock, well hydrated and she's out you know, snorting ketamine <laughs> until 5 a.m. and doing whatever with whoever. And I'd be like, we're in a relationship, but I don't stop her. Would you think I'm in a relationship? <laughs> Would you be like, wow, that's a relationship. and You're being really, that's not a relationship. The whole thing is, is, is gotten, it's so drenched in consumerism now that it's just become silly to me. That's why when people say to me, why aren't you married? I just laugh. I'm like, what, marry what? Marry, like, there's no people. Show me a person. <laughs> Show me a person who's not completely drenched in this preposterous, degenerate ideology. And maybe I'd consider it. I'm not carrying other people's weight for them. There's order in relationships. If I'm ordered and my partner's chaos, I either have to, I either have to carry her chaos. I can't, think, I can't think how it would work otherwise. You'd just be like, oh, I'm in a relationship with somebody who I see once every three weeks while she's sleeping with whoever, it's like, come on, like, that's, that's just stupid. We want to think of things in this preposterous ideological framework of absolute unrestrained consumerism. Anybody can be anything. Anyone can do anything. You can define relationships however you want. Okay, go ahead, try it. Get back to me when you're sad. Get back to me when you've been hurt by, by these notions of unrestrained 
selfish, consumerist, pleasure-seeking liberalism. And I mean liberalism not as a classic liberal, I mean it in the worst, in the worst possible way, where we just take the restraints off everything and pretend that that's good. Where we adopt an ideology that says all hierarchies and all boundaries are bad, so we're going to do whatever we want. You're not, by the way. You're, nobody, nobody really actually experiences freedom that way. That's uh, only a game, a kind of a, another psychological game of hide and seek, where we behave as toddlers playing dress up. You're not actually being free. You're playing the role of somebody who's living a life of freedom, but you never actually firsthand experience that freedom, which is why that archetypal person who you may recognize, because we all know somebody who's like that on the spectrum, of a girl, or it could be a guy who's completely unrestrained, completely open, completely free, they're always massively emotionally dysregulated. And part of the trauma, they're, they're being traumatized and they're traumatizing themselves through their own lifestyles because they think this is the peak of living and I'm still miserable. I'm still miserable because they're not really experiencing freedom, though they're telling themselves that they are and the culture they're in is, is confirming it. You are free, you are free, you are free. What's the freedom? The freedom to do what? The freedom to do what? I can take any drug that I want. Wow, wow, I'm jealous of that freedom. You can have 15 different flavors of hangover. Wow, that's, wow, free. You can feel shit in 15 different ways with 15 different types of alcohol, drugs. Come on, guys, like, it's, this, is, this is madness. We're going to have to start submitting again to the idea of order to the idea of boundaries, of going, this is what I want a relationship to look like, and I have to do my part. I can't expect my partner to be shadow integrated and ordered if I'm a chaotic, unshadow integrated mess. Apart from the fact that that's just unfair, it won't work. It what Love and relationships are not products and services to be consumed. It's more like, it's, it's actually, I think it's more like a religious discipline where you trade off. You say, I'm going to do things that I definitely wouldn't do if I was single because I want the experience of being in this th third thing. So there's me, there's my partner, and there's the third entity called the relationship. I believe, this is religious language, because people say, I believe in relationships, or I believe in love, or I believe in monogamy. It's religious. I'm going to do the disciplined rites and rituals of the relationship because I believe in love. I believe in relationships. I believe this is the right way for me to live. I believe that the, the juice is worth the squeeze, effectively. I like companionship. I like sharing a life. I like uh, sexual intimacy that has a degree of regularity and, and safety. To, whatever the thing is, you're still behaving religiously if you know what I mean, with, with a, a sense of discipline, rites, rituals, uh, sacrifices, because you're sacri you don't get to do whatever you want any time that you get to do it. You forego these uh, faux liberal pleasures for, for a life somewhat more constrained for more transcendent pleasures, for pleasures that go beyond the mere material and momentary. Thomas, am I sounding more conservative and religious every time I speak? It's as I get older, right? I think I'm, I'm getting old. This is why I'm wearing the black t-shirt, the black shirt. I'll wear a dog collar next time. You must transcend these material pleasures for the greater pleasures of love or what? Okay, that's it. Ladies and gentlemen, thank you very much for your time and your attention. Um, keep your faith in God. <laughs> Behave morally, you wretched fornicators. Goodbye. Hello, folks. Just to let you know, we now have a new course out. It's finally finished. It's called Unplug from the Matrix of Narcissistic Abuse, and it's available from richardgrannon.com. Just hit this link right here, and you can go get it.